Hello and welcome to the U.S. Election Dialogues, a weekly show where we decode the world's biggest presidential election. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay. In 2016, the, U the United States witnessed a political earthquake of sorts. Donald Trump, defying all odds, secured a stunning victory in a bitter presidential election. Four years later, he's trying the same again. But he faces tougher challenger, challenges, if not necessarily a challenger. A pandemic has killed more than 200,000 Americans. The United States is the worst affected country in the world. China is challenging the global leadership of America. And within the country, race tensions have split the electorate. So can Trump defy all expectations and win again, beat the opinion polls and win the re-election bid? To discuss this and more, I'm joined by our dialogue partners. From Washington, D.C., Lieutenant Stephen Rogers, an advisor to the Trump re-election campaign. Senior journalist Ray Locker also joins us from Washington, D.C. Republican strategist Julian Thompson with us from Atlanta in Georgia. And from California, we're joined by Spencer Critchley, a former advisor to the, to the Obama campaign. Hello and welcome to all of you. Good to be here. Thanks, Thanks for having us. <clears throat> Lieutenant Rogers, Donald Trump began his campaign in 2016 with a promise. He wanted to build a wall. That signature slogan has been all but forgotten. And now he's claiming immunity to the Wuhan virus to win votes. What is this re-election campaign all about? And what is his agenda for the second term, if he has one? There's two uh, major <clears throat> issues that's very important to the American people as we enter into this campaign. One is the economy. He uh, promised that he would strengthen the economy, and he did. Uh, the quality of life in this country has grown since he's been in office. Retirement funds are big, uh, regulations are cut, taxes were cut. So that's number one. The second one, predominantly on the minds of people, are law and order. Under Democrat-controlled cities, law and order doesn't exist. We all know that. No one can deny what they have seen uh, across this country with regard to anarchy. So two issues, the economy and law and order. Economy and law and order. Ray Locker, many pundits are saying that Don Donald Trump is no longer running against a political opponent. He's running against the virus from China. Does this election result depend on how Trump shapes the narrative on the pandemic more than anything else? Well, if that is the uh, question, then he's already lost. I mean, most people have judged his response uh, to the pandemic as unsuccessful. Most polls show that. Um, you know, and once he contracted the disease himself, his poll standing decreased even more. So if that's the standard by which he's going to be judged, he's already unsuccessful. That's not to say, you know, that he hasn't done other things well, because he has. He's had some successes. But uh, the pandemic has politically has been a loser for him. Julian Thompson, last year Donald Trump said, and I'm quoting, I could stand in the middle of the Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and wouldn't lose any voters. Well, he may have misjudged that because that doesn't seem to be the case with all the opinion polls now saying that he's trailing by a significant margin. The president was out of action due to his diagnosis. How does he plan to make up for all this lost ground? Well, first of all, regarding the polls, the polls uh, said one thing in 2016 as well, and the election turned out a very different way than the polls stated. I think that there is a certain factor involved in uh, poll taking with regard to how questions are asked and also with regard to the fact that there are people who are frankly afraid to express how they really feel for fear of some sort of retribution if they are a Trump supporter. because. As my colleague Stephen Rogers said, there has been a lot of um, anarchy, there has been a lot of violence in the streets, and a lot of anti-law and order um, protesting. And so people have been afraid to actually express who they support in a lot of polling, just as they did in 2016. The bottom line is the economy. And yes, COVID-19 is extremely important, absolutely, no doubt about that. But the fact of the matter is uh, he, he has made tremendous strides with our economy. He has turned our economy around. And the fact of the matter is people want to be at work. People want to be back at work. They want their businesses open. They want their children back at school. 
And so this, this upcoming election is going to be about the economy. It's going to be about law and order. Uh, this is something that a lot of people have said. The last time around, the polls predicted a comfortable win for Hillary Clinton. We all know how that ended. And yet uh, the Democrats believe that this time will be different. Are you one of them and why? Yes, and I think that actually, you know, the story about the polls being wrong in 2016 is not actually accurate. The national polls were very accurate. Uh, we had kind of a black swan event in the battleground states, and Trump ended up winning. There were some flaws in the state polls. I also think all of this can be seen as really two uh, different groups of people in the United States living within two completely different worldviews, which is why it's so often hard to talk across the divide we have now. And I, I talk about this in my book, Patriots of Two Nations. And it's as if one nation lives within the enlightenment tradition of reason on which the country was founded, but we've missed the fact there's always been a counter enlightenment resistance, which values faith and tradition and mythology and symbolism more. So what my Republican friends just said is actually factually untrue, but to Trump supporters, it feels like a higher truth to talk about law and order and a thriving economy. Neither of those things is true. Violent crime has been declining in the United States steadily since the 90s including in so-called Democrat-run cities. The Obama recovery was stronger. The growth was stronger in every way under Obama, and Trump has slowed it down while exploding the debt. And this so-called anarchy in the cities is almost entirely peaceful protests against racial injustice. But we could argue the facts and get nowhere. Uh, a lot of that stuff just feels symbolically true to Trump supporters, I believe. And Democrats actually go wrong when they miss that and talk only about facts and logic like I just did. We have to recognize what's the symbolic appeal of a figure like President Trump. Stephen Rogers, I'd like you to respond to that. And also, uh, this, is, this has been uh, a long-standing topic of discussion. Is the American election really about fact versus fake news? Well, I've got to tell you, with all due respect to my colleague who was just on the air talking with you, explain that to the people in Chicago the ones I've met whose children have been shot and killed in the streets. Explain that to the people in Seattle that lost their homes and businesses. Explain that to the people in Minneapolis and New York City where the crime rate's up a thousand percent, where you can't find cops anymore. Explain what you just said to them that that's symbolic and not a reality. You see, the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of people who have been out on the streets, who have been busy with grassroots Americans, speaking with them, will learn what they are concerned about. So all of these uh, uh, theories and these ideas that this stuff is just symbolic is utter nonsense. I mean, my goodness, blood in the streets of this country is not symbolic. We see it. I was a police officer for 38 years. I've seen it my entire life. And now we're seeing it uh, become get to a point where truly we have to make a big, big turn in this country, bring law and order back. That is what is on the minds of the people. That is not symbolic. That is reality. Ray Locker, your thoughts on this? Was, was Obama's law and order record necessarily better? Because I remember doing a story where we said that police brutality was equally bad, if not worse. Well, there were incidents of police brutality and shootings of black people, uh, unarmed black people during the Obama administration, just as there are now and just as there have been, you know, in decades past. It's a long held pattern. It happens. Um, you know, I think we've seen a lot of incidents of this in the last year under the Trump administration, not necessarily caused by him, but in some cases exacerbated by him. You know, and I live in Washington, D.C., a Democrat-run city. Uh, I don't see signs of anarchy anywhere I go. Um, there have been protests. There have been some violent incidents, but it's not anarchy. I mean, I walk down any city street in Washington, and I don't feel in danger at all. Um, so I don't, I, you know, I disagree with that assessment of how things are going in certain parts of the country. Look, there have always been violent incidents. And as president, you know, President Trump has to bear some responsibility for that. It's happening under his watch. And so, you know, I don't know where we go forward. I think there, people view these things through different prisms, but depending on where they are. But from my perspective in Washington, I don't really see it that way. Julian Thompson, uh, 
Ray Locker is right when he says that there are violent crimes under every administration and there is crime in every society, under every government. Uh, but it's about how a leader deals with this. Many people accuse Donald Trump of dividing America, especially when he refuses to criticize white supremacists. Why has the president not been more vocal in his criticism of police brutality, especially against the African Americans? He has been. He's been very forthright in his criticism of police brutality, as well as the actions that he has put into place for the African American community with regard to HBCUs, which, with regard to prison reform. Um, and, you know, this is look back at the way that Joe Biden handled this with the uh, crime bill that he supported in the past, Donald Trump was able to undo that. And a lot of people have been removed from prison as a result of Donald Trump's actions. And going back to what the co my colleague on the left said after I spoke the last time, you know, the intellectual dishonesty and the smugness of people on the left is the reason why they have lost blue collar voters. Just as Barack Obama made fun of people of faith clinging to their guns and their religion, so goes the comments of my colleague on the left. And I mean, that is precisely the reason why blue collar voters have switched from the Democratic Party and have come over to the Republican Party because they're tired of their faith being insulted. And they are tired of Democrats saying, we're the smart ones, we're the ones that deal in logic and making fun of the fact that people of faith actually care about what goes on in our government, that people who are pro-law and order are somehow uh, under some misconception and that we're imagining the fact that there is violence in the streets. There is violence in the streets. It is on the left. Well, if Donald Trump criticized police brutality, coming back to your earlier point, I might have missed those sound bites because I don't remember covering any of it. Uh, having said that, intellectual dishonesty is something that the left has been accused of. Spencer Critchley, this is one of my favorite lines, democracies have become illiberal because liberals became undemocratic, and that's something that liberals the world over are dealing with. Uh, but when you talk about law and order, when you talk about violence, gun control remains a major issue in America and presidents from both sides, Republicans and Democrats, have failed to address it. Yes, and if I could, I actually agree with the critique of liberals as coming across as smug and arrogant. And I want to be clear, when I talk about people who support Trump valuing faith and tradition and mythology and symbolism, I'm not uh, dismissing that. I think Democrats have missed the importance of that and have been overly rational and have tended to come across as if they're lecturing and as, as if they're arrogant. It's also created the opening for a con man and demagogue like President Trump to come in and pretend to be somebody who satisfies their longing for these this deeper meaning and this more uh, sense of uh, love of country and all that that he's good at projecting, but it's completely phony in his case. And that's the issue here. Also, on the issue of police violence, I've worked for years with police departments, including advocating on behalf of an excellent police department when they were accused of, where they were accused of unjust officer-involved shootings. I've also worked in close partnership with the Obama Justice Department on the same issues. The Obama Justice Department was a model of addressing not just uh, racial bias issues in the uh, in policing in America but improved, smarter approaches to violence that were succeeding. So-called Democrat-run cities like San Jose uh, developed that model. And, and San Jose, for example, went from being one of the most dangerous large cities in America to one of the safest, following these enlightened practices that uh, the Obama administration was pursuing. Uh, gun violence is another issue I'm very familiar with, and I think also it's one that Democrats have been weak on in many cases through apparently showing they don't understand gun owners and gun culture. Uh, it's a complex issue that I think needs to be discussed at a more adult level. Also, the uh, thing about Obama talking about clinging to guns and religion, he, that was actually an example, although it was unfortunate to use the, the word clinging, of him telling liberals, do not dismiss the culture of working class white people with comments like clinging to guns and religion. You need to understand how the culture has deep meaning to them. And when you talk about gun nuts or religious wackos, you are being disrespectful and you're only harming Democrats. So I think that's really more the way to look at all of these issues. Right, let's talk about what, how Donald Trump has dealt with the world. Uh, 
Lieutenant Rogers, uh, Trump's critics would say that he's created more problems for America, though he calls himself the great deal maker. He started a trade war with China, and that's not seen a resolution yet. His approach to immigration has split families on borders, and friendly countries see America as an unpredictable ally. Well, I guess winning the Nobel Peace Prize uh, doesn't count. You see, they only see what they want to see and hear what they want to hear. He's brought a tremendous amount of progress in the Middle East. He's been able to get NATO to pay its fair share with regard to defense. Uh, he's well respected, uh, despite what the left is trying to say. In fact, I remember this year, some of the uh, leaders of the Baltic states were here and actually said, and, and you could look this up if you want, they actually said that Donald Trump was a man who could be trusted. So when it comes to foreign affairs, surely they're going to be critics uh, always. But the fact of the matter is he's done a lot of good for this country with regard to China. He's been hitting them very, very hard. Uh, so he has strengthened our uh, the world view, if you will. Uh, you're not going to hear about that from the left because that does not uh, uh, conform to their narrative. But what about it? What about the Nobel Peace Prizes? Is that rigged? Is that fixed? No. He deserved it. He got it because primarily, I believe, what he did in the Mideast. Doing a fine job with regard to Who foreign affairs. It? Who got the Nobel Barbie? Peace Prize? Well, I'm saying, what about that? What about that? Is he not uh, uh, down the road? He, he, he's been, it's been suggested that he get a Nobel Peace Prize. Well, nomination I mean, is not the same as winning. Uh, <laughs> no, but a nomination puts you right up there, doesn't it? I mean, it puts you there, uh, at least being considered for what? For some sort of progress. He would have never been considered if he uh, wasn't uh, nominated. I'm uh, not sure he was being uh, considered. I think, I think Nobel nomination works in a different way, and I'll be happy to discuss it with you some other time. Ray Locker, Donald Trump has taken a tough stand on China, blaming it for the pandemic. Do you think his approach has helped in building some sort of global momentum against China's aggression? Uh, in terms of the pandemic? Yes. No. Um, I, I mean, look. Everybody and their brother knew that this pandemic was coming from China. They knew China was lying about it because that's what China does. But the United States didn't really deal with it in an effective manner. It took some steps, but they didn't work. We dismantled the pandemic response unit inside the government. That could have gotten us uh, you know, farther ahead of this thing. Um, so our response to that hasn't been very successful. Um, you know, the Trump administration has taken a variety of stands against China, some of them effective, some of them not effective. Um, you know, when it comes to some of China's trade policies, the administration's been effective in saying, look, stop what you're doing. But in other cases, you know, it reverses itself and causes just as many problems. And if I may get back to the point about the Nobel Peace Prize, you know, the nomination of President Trump the first time was cooked up by somebody uh, in Norway, who was pressured to nominate him and said that they really didn't do it. Um, he didn't win the Nobel Peace Prize. He probably won't win the Nobel Peace Prize. Some of the things he's done in terms of foreign affairs, like the UAE-Israel deal, has been effective and should be applauded, and I think he's been recognized for that. But that, by the way, the Nobel Prize should not be the only standard by which people judge this president. Um, and in terms of China policy, Sometimes he's worked well, sometimes he hasn't. And on the pandemic, I think you got to say it hasn't succeeded so far. Right. And I wouldn't make such a big deal of the Nobel Peace Prize because I'm still not sure what Barack Obama won it for. But Julian Thompson, <laughs> Donald Trump has withdrawn America from many international organizations. And uh, his critics say that these moves have left a vacuum, that the, the U.S. is leaving its position of global leadership and China is just waiting for this opportunity to fill in the gap. Well, first of all, let me say Trump was not uh, nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. You would be saying, or my colleagues on the left would be saying, look, he wasn't even nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize, but Barack Obama was. But because he was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize, somehow it's an illegitimate or cooked up nomination. So he's sort of damned if he does and damned if he doesn't. So that's kind of the way things work for him uh, with regard to the left. It was actually Joe Biden that called the fact that uh, President Trump put a travel ban on China during pre uh, pandemic preparations in the United States. It was Joe Biden that called that xenophobic. So President Trump has been very forthright and very forward 
with his policies regarding China, with regard to the pandemic, and with regard to his global policies. And the fact of the matter is, the American people judge a leader on their actions. They judge them by their policies. And the reason that Donald Trump won his election in the first place is because people were sick and tired of politicians on the left and on the right that governed, that uh, campaigned one way and governed another. And Donald Trump was an outsider. He came in and he actually is one of the only presidents I can remember in my lifetime that actually kept his campaign promises. Well, he can't play the outsider card anymore. Too bad for him. He's been in office for four years. Uh, uh, Spencer Critchley, Joe Biden, from what I see and read in the U.S. press, is seen as soft on China. And three presidents before Donald Trump have attempted to bring peace in West Asia. But we have to give him his due. He has managed to strike an accord while his predecessors failed. Would you say that the Abrahams Accord was a foreign policy masterstroke of Donald Trump? I think that, um, you know, Trump has bungled his uh, dealings with China and been played by uh, China the way he has been with North Korea, with Russia, and in virtually all of his international dealings. Um, this is also a case where, you know, I think that we can repeat assertions as if they're, in effect, articles of faith and or magical spells, but they ultimately don't make it true. It doesn't actually change reality. So. Donald Trump has caused the international reputation of the United States to plummet. And all you need to do is Google the actual statistics of what, what is West international Asia? public opinion. Pardon me? What about oh, in, West Asia? So in Asia, you know, I agree that uh, China, yes, needed to have the line drawn as it was being drawn before. There were many abuses going on. West Asia, so West Asia is what I'm talking about, the Abraham Accords. I'm sorry. You're going to have to tell me more about what you're looking for there. Would you say that this was a foreign policy win for Donald Trump? Oh, well, you know, he takes credit for many things that he played very little role in. For example, the Middle East Accord that was just mentioned, which I agree we need to recognize as real progress, but a lot of the credit there needs to go to the foreign minister for the, for the UAE and for conditions that were outside of President Trump's control. We also need to not describe it as a peace deal. So I think we see this in accords in countries around the world where he takes credit essentially when things go well, uh, where it's seldom deserved, and then shifts the blame if there's the slightest suggestion that it's not going well. I think there's much to criticize about Donald Trump, but, but this was his win. And he should be given credit. I'm out of time or I would have taken closing comments with all of you. Stephen Rogers, Ray Locker, Julian Thompson and Spencer Critchley. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time.